Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Well, what do you think? Should we celebrate today? Yes. Let's. Because today is Christ the King Sunday. And that only rolls around once a year. It's the Sunday before Advent begins. And it's when, when, we, when we think about Christ being King. But we'll, I, strangely enough, we'll be talking about that later. Uh, let's start with a call to worship in your bulletins. We call now all the people of God to come. Men, women, and children, come. Come and worship your King. Fill this place with song. Fill this place with joy. Fill this place with worship. Give glory to the one true God, who is over all, and in all, and through all. People of God, come. Come and worship. And let us sing, Come be thankful, people. Come, number 367.
It is absolutely a wonderful day. Everybody ready? Look, it's, we have strangers in our midst coming for Thanksgiving. They are strangers. How neat is that? <laughs> and no, you're not stranger than most. <laughs> well, you know, I want to talk today about what is difficult. Now, for me, when I was a kid, back in the day, I used to play baseball for Mitchell Oil Company. And I liked playing baseball a lot. Until it was the playoffs. It was the playoffs. We were one, one run down. The two guys uh, that were batting before me struck out. So here I am. The whole thing depended on me. And I got up and I whiffed. Struck out, we lost the championship, lost the game, and that was really hard. It was hard, so hard, how hard was it? That I never really played baseball, I never played organized baseball again. And we are asked all through our lives to do hard things. You know, could be baseball, I just have this mental image of Jack Rouse playing tennis. That would be hard. That would be hard. <laughs> <laughs> and we do a lot of hard things. And you know, one of, the, one of the hard things that we're asked to do is tell the truth. Remember, well, in our um, scripture for today, we have Pilate asking Jesus, what is truth? And it's hard. Telling the truth is one of the hard things we have to do. And you can't get, I'm not going to get into a philosophical discussion about what truth is. But truth, you know when, when you say it, and you know when you're lying. And Christ asks us each and every day to do the hard thing, to get up, it was the sixth inning, get up in the sixth inning and go to bat. Christ asks us to do the hard thing and tell the truth, tell the truth to our neighbors, to our families, to everybody. And we'll get, we'll get into that a little bit later. Tell the truth. <laughs> Our first scripture today comes from da -da -da -da, the book of Daniel. We never hear the book of Daniel but it's on page uh, 703, and it's Daniel 9, 10, 13, and 14. And at this time, Daniel's having a vision from God, something that John had in the book of Revelation, something that Ezekiel had in his book. But since this is Christ the King Sunday, the lectionary has included Daniel's vision of Christ. It's an apocalyptic prose written over 500 years before the appearance of Christ. Christ, keep that in the back of your mind. 500 years before the appearance of Christ. Daniel says, as I looked, thrones were set in place and the Ancient of Days took his seat. His clothing was white as snow, his hair on his head was white like wool. His throne was flaming with fire and its wheels were all ablaze. A river of fire was flowing, coming out from before him. Thousands upon thousands attended him. 10,000 times 10,000 stood before him. The court was seated and the books were opened. In my vision, at night I looked, and there before me was one like the Son of Man, 
coming with the clouds of heaven. He approached the Ancient of Days and was led into his presence. He was given authority, glory, and sovereign power. All nations and peoples of every language worshiped him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion that will not pass away. And his kingdom is one that will never be destroyed. We go to Psalms now. And we're going to Psalm 93. And in this Psalm, we see that the divine king is mightier than chaos. It speaks, this whole Psalm speaks of the mightiness of Christ. Of God, I'm sorry. The Lord reigns. He is robed in majesty. The Lord is robed in majesty and armed with strength. Indeed, the world is, is established firm and secure. Your throne was established long ago. You are from all eternity. The seas have lifted up, Lord. The seas have lifted up their voice. The seas have lifted up their pounding waves. Mightier than the thunder of the great waters, mightier than the breakers of the sea, the Lord on high is mighty. Your statutes, Lord, stand firm. Holiness adorns your house for endless days. And then, strangely enough, we go from Psalms to John. Now, we haven't heard much from John this year, but the people are on outside, on the outside of the palace, for to enter it would make them ritually unclean. So Jesus speaks to Pilate in a personal way, but Jesus refused to be drawn into Pilate's discussion. John 18, 33 to 37 on page 101. Pilate then went back inside the palace, summoned Jesus and asked, are you the king of the Jews? Is that your own idea, Jesus asked, or did others talk to you about me? Am I a Jew, Pilate replied? Your own people and chief priests handed you over to me. What is it you have done? Jesus said, My kingdom is not of this world. If it were, my servants would fight to prevent my arrest by the Jewish leaders. But now, my kingdom is from another place. You are king then, Pilate said. And Jesus answered, You say that I am a king. In fact, the reason I was born and came into this world is to testify to the truth. Everyone on the side of truth listens to me. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be pleasing to you, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. The lectionary shifts this week. While we've been hanging out in the Synoptic Gospels and some of the letters, today is Christ the King Sunday. We switch to Jesus being in front of Pilate with him asking Jesus, are you the King of the Jews? We are further haunted by Pilate's later question to Jesus, what is truth? I have a story. Imagine. Picking your car up from the shop after a routine tune-up, and the technician says, Ah, this car is in great shape. Clearly, you have an automotive genius to take great care of the car. Later that day, your brakes don't work, you find out you're out of brake fluid, and you could have died. So you go back to the shop and you say, Why didn't you tell me? The technician replies, Well, I didn't want you to feel bad. Plus, to be honest, I was afraid you might get upset with me. I want this to be a safe place where you feel loved and accepted. You'd be furious. You'd say, I didn't come here for a little fantasy-based ego boost. When it comes to my car, I want the truth. Or, even better yet, imagine going to a doctor's office for a checkup. The doctor says to you, oh, you are a magnificent physical specimen. You have the body of an Olympian, and you are to be congratulated. <laughs> later that day, while climbing the stairs, your heart gives out. You find out later that your arteries were so clogged that you were like one jelly donut away from the Grim Reaper. 
So you go back to the doctor and you say, why didn't you tell me? Well, the doctor says, well, I knew your body was in worse shape than the Pillsbury Doughboy, but if I tell people stuff like that, they get kind of offended. So it's kind of bad for business. They don't come back. I want this to be a safe place where you feel loved and accepted. You'd be furious. When it comes to my body, I want the truth. That story comes from John Ortberg. I guess the line from the movies that applies most to, comes from Jack Nicholson, who said in A Few Good Men, you know what? You can't handle the truth. Do we want, do we want to know the truth? It's something we really need to, is it something we really need to understand? It's one thing to say that we want the truth, but quite another to actually, in reality, definitely want it. When you think of truth in our world today, face it, truth is rather subjective. What's the best laundry soap? If something is new and improved, how can it be both? These are subjective truths. I'm only going to mention in passing perhaps the most subjective truth in our country today is whatever politicians are telling us. Their, their truth is many and varied. But to answer Pilate's question, we have to dig a little deeper. Is Christ the King of the Jews? Is Christ a king at all? And just what does it mean if he is or if he isn't? Therein lies the crux of today. If indeed Christ is the king of the Jews, we tend to think that about something far away in a long ago place in a long ago time. But Christ, if Christ is king of the Palestinian Jews in 33 AD, and if he was king then, that means that Christ is king here and now as well, because a Messiah is a king for all places and all times. We have such a convoluted idea of what a king really is and what he does. We think of Queen Elizabeth who performs ceremonial functions without any real power in the governing of the country. Do you know that her one big power is that she chooses the head of the Episcopalian Church. That's about it. Other than that, it's all ceremonial. Did you know that King Juan Carlos has abdicated the throne in Spain? Bet you didn't know. Kings don't matter much today. They're not a big deal. But back in the day, all the power was concentrated in one person. When one was a Caesar of Rome, one was a god to be worshipped and adored. When one god died, there would be another, usually a relative, to take his place. And later on, kings throughout Europe and Asia held the power of life and death over their subjects. It was only until the Magna Carta in 1215 in England that others had any kind of power at all. Being a king today, just ain't what it used to be. So Jesus didn't jump up and say right away that he was a king. He saw that Pilate was asking questions, leading questions, simply to make his political life easier. If Jesus said that he was a king, it would have been in direct confrontation with Caesar, would be an offense punishable by death. He was troubled. Because if he, indeed, if people thought that he was a king, it would change everything about the world as they knew it. It would create upheaval and chaos. Pilate was a skeptic, and he saw Jesus as just a troublemaker. So that chaos was the last thing that Pilate wanted. The country was supposed to behave. The country was supposed to pay its taxes. So he was doing his best that he could to give Jesus all the outs that were possible so that Pilate's world wouldn't be all messed up, so that Pilate's world wasn't changed, so that Pilate's world 
would go on just as it was. And isn't that often what we do when we think of Jesus? If he was only a troublemaker in the first century, then it doesn't impact here us today. If he was only a good teacher and came out with lots of platitudes, like love the Lord and that pesky love your neighbor as yourself, then I can go on with my life as I want to today. Even if he was the Son of God, which many faiths other than our own actually think he was, it was for a far removed culture 2,000 years ago, and if it was for them, maybe I can keep doing just what I want to do. I don't have to worry about Christ. This is exactly what Pilate wanted to do, not worry about Christ. Pilate was sent to Judah not to rock the boat, to get for Caesar what was Caesar's, and to keep the ship on an even keel. That's it. It's a goal for many of us to keep our lives on an even keel. Just like the Romans, we don't want any disruptions in our lives. We don't want to know that Christ is King of the Jews. We have a difficult time understanding that he may come from God, but he came for us. And when I say us, I do indeed mean this church, but I also mean that Christ came for each and every one of us. Not only has he come for each and every one of us, he has come for every man, woman, and child in the beautiful town of Sharon and York, and even for the 4.8 million folks in the state of South Carolina. He has come for the dreaded Yankees, the folks in the middle of the country, and the people even in the north and northwest, and even the Californians. Believe it or not, they count too. Christ indeed has a sense of humor. Christ has come for the Canadians. Christ has come for the Bolivians. Christ has come for the Europeans and the Chinese and everyone else in the world. And it's all because Christ is indeed the King of the Jews and the ripples go out from there like a stone dropped in a pond so many years ago. Because if Christ is King of the Jews, and if Christ is the Son of Man, then Christ is your King as well. And there is not a King who has lived that has not changed lives. So let's think a little bit of truth. If today is Christ the King Sunday, is Christ the King? Are you ready to become a follower of the king and listen to his commands? It's very easy to acknowledge him as king, but is he truly the king? We can pay lip service as a king, but is Christ seriously the king of your life? <clears throat> can you handle the truth? Because if we say Christ is king, but it really isn't, then we can just go on about our lives and live for good old number one. The church can do without my offering this week, and maybe the refugees from Syria are someone else's problem. If Christ isn't really the king, then life can go on just as we know it, and tomorrow would be the same as today. But if Christ is really the king, then we're bound to listen to him. We are forced to listen to what Christ says. Now, it would be nice if it stopped there, and all we had to do was listen. But it goes farther than that. Once we listen, we need to do something about it. We need to act. I want you to imagine going up to old, good old Julius Caesar and saying, you know, Julius, this Rome of yours is really in tough shape. I think someone should do something about it. I think it would be that point that good old Caesar would do some rearranging of your body parts. But when Christ says, pick up your cross daily and follow me, we think it's a great idea, and we should definitely think about doing that someday. When the king says, pick up your sword and follow me, that's a battle cry, and you can't dawdle only as long as it would take you to find your sword. You would know that if you didn't, there would be repercussions but to actually 
follow Christ the King wherever he may lead seems like an optional choice to many of us. And Christ doesn't force being the king on any of us. Unlike traditional kings, we get to decide if Christ is king of our lives or not. Just like Pilate, we have to make that decision. Strangely enough, it's through Pilate's decision that we get to make our own. Pilate, in the end, decided it would work to treat Christ as a king and a threat to the empire. Is Christ a threat to whatever you have made <coughs> king of your life? Make no mistake about it, each and every one of us gets to decide who or what is king in our lives. For some, it's money. For some, it's work. For some, it's security and retirement. For some, it's family. What is your king? Starting next week, you won't have to think about that. Starting next week, we go back to the good old comforting baby Jesus. We go back to thinking about how wonderful and nice it is that God came into the world to save us and to love us. But for this week, let us ponder the questions concerning who Christ is and what part does he have in the living of our lives. How has Christ changed your life? How will Christ change your life from here on out? To what extent is Christ the king of your life? As a matter of fact, what is the truth of your life? To what truth do you belong? We all like easy truths, as did the folks in the beginning, from the mechanic and from the doctor. We all like to hear that our car and our body are fine, just fine. It allows us to stop right there and leave it at that. But if Christ, if the goal isn't the truth of Christ and everything is fine, then what is truth? If you're a kid, you might venture an answer. It is noteworthy that there's no evidence that Jesus responded to the proconsul's question. And you have to figure out that if Jesus, King of kings, Lords of lords, present at creation and in whom the fullness of God dwelt bodily, didn't tackle the question, maybe it's best left alone. Granted, Jesus had a lot on his plate right then. You can't blame him for saying, hey, can we do this another time? Do you belong to the truth of Christ the King? Christ the friend, Christ the co-pilot, Christ the teacher, Christ the son of God, or Christ the irrelevant. The truth has a whole bunch of sides to it. What is your truth? How does your truth affect your life? As you leave this place, ask yourself the question, what is your truth? If you're able, could we stand and say the Apostles' Creed together? I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. And in your bulletins, there's an insert with Christ has made the sure foundation. Let us sing together.
Are there any prayer requests today? Great evening. My brother-in-law, Joe Rogers. I mean, son-in-law. Son-in-law. Okay. Larry Hitson. Larry who? Hitson. Hitson. Hitson, okay. You mind him? His knee recovered. My friend Mike in Indiana. I'm sorry? My friend Mike, Mike. in Indiana. Charlotte Harris and her family and the loss of her brother. I know that we're all keeping Peggy Montgomery in prayer as well. Any others? Then let us pray. God of the ages, God who was here before the universe was born, God who is here now each and every moment. God who never changes. God help us, help us to be thankful to you each and every day. Let us be thankful in the morning, in the evening, and the night. Let us thank you for all that you give us. Sometimes we don't see it, sometimes we don't realize it, but you are watching out for each and every one of us. For that, Lord, we thank you. Lord, we ask that you be in the midst of each person's life today, each person in this church, each person in this town and country, each person in this world. Show them your love, show them your care, caring, show them your patience, show them your mind. Lord, we ask your blessings Ask your blessings on so many people. We ask your blessings on Ricky Meek, on Joe Rogers, Larry Hitson. We pray for quick, quick and painless healing for Hugh. We pray for Mike in Indiana. Lord, we ask that you keep Shirley and, and the family in prayer. And we ask your prayers of comfort for Peggy Montgomery. We ask your blessings on Barry Tinker, on Rebecca Hutton, Hutterder, Hutterder, on Mark Heifel, and as always, Sadie and Toot. We ask your blessing just because we love you and we want to thank you in the way that Jesus taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, Lord, in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Are there announcements today? I want you to think about taking a look with all the inserts that came with your bulletin today. Because the Clinton Presbytery community is requesting donations. And you can read that. I don't need to read the whole thing. Bring things in. These people, have you ever been there? These people live a joyous life, but they live simply. So to help them, let us donate from, from our wealth to help them as well. Each of you has one of these for poinsettias. And it would be wonderful if we, again, could fill this altar with poinsettias in honor of 
Christmas in honor, in honor of coming of Christ. So, get your 14 bucks in. I need to make an announcement, please. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> um, this week, uh, Miss Pressler gave me our first three uh, snowmen for the snowman tree. Of course, at school, we can't call it the angel tree. Anyway, we, it is an angel tree in my book, but, but um, anyway, I have already given those to our elves. And beginning next week, we will begin collecting money um, to help support these children who are in need. And hopefully we might get a couple more. I think our gifts are really phenomenal. Um, I know that they go out and they're able to purchase many wonderful things due to your generosity. So just please keep that on your heart. And I'm sorry that I always ask y'all for money. Thank you. Tis that time of year. This is season. Jen. The women's breakfast date is incorrect in the bulletin. It's then what pretty and pray tell is the women's breakfast date? This coming Saturday, 28th, I think. 27th. 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 Instead of yesterday. <laughs> Team. Uh, Starting next Sunday, we'll have the Christmas card presented. I'll have the bags for the um, um, cards downstairs. In the fellowship hall, you can either put them in the bags or I put them in my sales. Thank you. And I'll have a list of people's names also. Thank you, Dean. Any other announcements? Thank you. The Presbyterian community, next Sunday is the last Sunday where we will be collecting donations. So that we can give over there so they can give all sorted and distributed in the Christmas. So next Sunday is the last Sunday that we'll be collecting. So remember to bring in your gifts. Also next Sunday we'll start a sign-up sheet for our soup dinner we're going to have on December 19th. So that people can get signed up what they will bring. And we'd like to know how many people are going to be here as well. And we'd also like to congratulate these two on their First day of the <laughs> Well, on, on their first anniversary in the Clemson one. <laughs> Wait a minute, Patrick didn't smile at the anniversary thing, but the minute he said Clemson won, the smile came. There, there's a problem. <laughs> and I didn't stay for the end. Did South Carolina win? Got it. So. So now we can all pray for the Giants today. Or no, Giants are Monday night against... Um, Somebody. No, the, um, Kansas City. I know you all want to pray for the Giants, really. <laughs> okay. Oh, one other thing. This Thursday, no matter where you are and what you're doing, be thankful. Be thankful not only for the meal, not only for the company, but be thankful for a God that loves you and shows it in so many ways. So, have a wonderful Thanksgiving. Okay, let us now take our morning offering.
for the ability to give these gifts. We thank you for sharing each one of them with your people. We thank you for loving us as you do. Lord, bless these gifts and bless us in Christ's name. Amen. And let us sing We Gather Together, number 336. Thanksgiving. Amen.